Six weeks before our story begins, my trust was unbroken, my heart intact. In college, I met Melanie. Our love was a beacon of hope, a promise of a future bright. Yet the facade cracked at a party, where whispers in the shadows and a glance not meant for me sowed seeds of doubt. Why, Melanie? I asked later, confronting her, only to be met with evasion. It's not what you think, she whispered, a lie so frail against the weight of her betrayal. As the silence stretched between us, I found myself asking, Then what is it, Melanie? Can love truly masquerade as something so cruel? This is the tale of how my world unraveled. Enjoy watching it. My name's Kurt Van Hall, and up until a bit ago, I was blind to who my wife really was. Yep, loved her once. Not anymore. I'm about to make her regret fooling me. I should have seen the signs after our July 4th party with friends. That night, she came on to me, something she never does. She was all over me like she hadn't been in 17 years. At first, I thought she was just a bit tipsy, but happy. I hoped it would keep up, but it didn't. Come August, she cooled off, and by Labor Day, she was annoyed at me for wanting her too much. I blamed myself for missing the signs, but they were there. At a Halloween party, that's when it clicked. My wife, Melanie, wanted to dress sexy. She was five foot three, not heavy, with bright red hair. She looked stunning in her outfit. But the moment that opened my eyes, when she walked in after vanishing for a while, looking too calm, it hit me then. The July sex must have been guilt. Her new extra hours at the animal shelter where she worked, the way she seemed distant, the lack of interest in me. So who was it? I couldn't tell, but I decided to dig deeper before confronting her. Melanie and I are from different worlds. She's from the West Coast, me from Iowa. We met in college at Cornell College, not the big Ivy League one, but a small liberal arts school in Iowa. I was raised 30 minutes away in a place filled with Dutch heritage folks. Melanie was from California, much more liberal than my background. She ended up in Iowa because her folks, who met there, wanted her to experience some Midwest values. We first met in the library. She was struggling with math, asking for a Math for Dummies book. I've always been good at math, so when I heard her, I had to help. She looked frustrated when the librarian said the book was checked out. I walked over, introduced myself, and offered to help her with algebra. She looked at me funny, but agreed. I joked about being her knight, which made her laugh. She was Melanie. I was Kurt. We made a deal. If I helped her pass, she'd owe me pizza. But not any pizza. It had to be from Gus Antonius, a well-known place in town. From there, well, things took off. But now? Now I'm here, writing huge checks to charities, including one we both supported, the Wounded Warrior Project trying to find some peace and maybe shake things up for Melanie, who'd blindsided me with a side I never knew. In Vernon, Iowa, I made a bet. If you get a C on your test, what's in it for me? I asked. A kiss after dinner, she replied. And what about Abby? I was hoping for a real date. Help me with that and I'll let the girls out, she said, her hands still on her chest. My eyes must have popped because she laughed. Get me an A and you can have whatever you want, she added. She didn't trust in her learning skills or my teaching. That's some deal, I thought. We needed a quiet place to study. So into my car we went, heading to Denny's. We took a booth. I got us nachos and told the waitress we'd stay for hours, but I'd tip well. Melanie really struggled with math, especially algebra. She couldn't see how letters stood in for numbers. So I began with the basics. Three plus four equals? She got that. Seven, she answered. Okay, I said. Imagine the letters as spaces. Why? She wondered. Because every space can have a different value. We use letters to tell them apart, I explained. Three plus four equals? I wrote down. Think of A as the space we talked about. So what's A in this case? Seven, she said. Okay, three plus B equals seven, I wrote. What's B? Four, she replied. We use different letters for different values. Here's another. Three times X equals six, I wrote. What's B? She mistakenly said B is two, mixing up the symbols. We worked through multiplication and division using letters and numbers. Slowly, she began to understand. We stayed until the early morning. By 10, she had her class. I told her to sleep well. Don't cram last minute. 
She thanked me with a cheek kiss and hinted at hoping for an A with a playful look. I wondered, did she mean what I think? Couldn't wait to hear how she did. I didn't get everything promised, but I got pizza and kisses, and things seemed to hint at more. Eventually, she did get an A, and we became a thing. Summer was nearing, and I needed an internship. I hoped for Southern California to stay close to her, but ended up in San Francisco at Numi. It was a drive away, so weekends were our time. I met her family. They seemed to like me, happy I'd settled their girl. We cherished our weekends together. Back at college, we both hit the books hard. We discussed futures. I dreamed of a big family, but she was into zero population growth. We settled on hoping for just two kids. Dream houses were up for debate, too. I wanted something humble. She dreamed bigger. Guess I'd need a good job. We wanted different things from life. She had causes she cared about that didn't quite align with my views. But we agreed to disagree. By senior year, I landed a job in Michigan thanks to my new me internship. A big move awaited. On the drive back from my final interview, I planned it all. Proposed to Melanie, help her find a job nearby, and start our life in the suburbs of Detroit. I pictured our future life vividly. Married, a home, kids, and all the joys and chaos of a family. After the kids went off to college, we planned to start seeing the world. On my way back home, I made a stop in Chicago. I had my $5,000 bonus with me, ready to buy a ring. I walked into a small jewelry store and picked out a ring set for $4,000. Feeling over the moon, I rushed back to Mount Vernon and called Melanie. I wanted us to go out for dinner. During dessert, I asked her to marry me. She cried yes. Then I shared my job news. She was happy but worried about Michigan's cold. I reassured her it wouldn't be that different from Iowa. We quickly prepared for the wedding and married in California on May 23rd. Our honeymoon was at Niagara Falls. By June 1st, we were setting up our first apartment since I began my job, and Melanie got work through a temp agency, hoping to find something bigger eventually. Life had its own plans, though. Just eight months in, we were ecstatic to learn a baby was on the way. We bought a cozy Cape Cod-style house. Not big, but perfect for starting our family. Then came Kaylee Jane, or KJ, as I called her. With her strawberry blonde hair and blue eyes, she was our perfect little mix. Her grip stole my heart instantly. Things changed after KJ was born, especially our intimacy. Melanie seemed to have lost interest, and discussions about it grew heated. Hoping for a boy next, I tried everything. Our doctor suggested it might be postpartum depression, while a therapist thought it was PTSD from a tough childbirth. Despite therapy, progress was slow. Eventually, I focused my love and attention on Kaylee, and Melanie stayed home, volunteering instead of returning to work. Seventeen years later, though our home and jobs were great, I sensed something off. At a party, I needed to escape. Using a migraine as an excuse, I managed to get us home early. Alone in our room, I strategized on uncovering the truth. Melanie's phone conversation from downstairs reached my ears. She mentioned not being able to return to someone named Jack because of my migraine. Jack Anderson, a recent arrival to our circle with his family. Plans began forming in my head on how to deal with this newfound revelation. Jasmine was a bit older than KJ, yet they were still pals. She was off to Wayne State University but stayed at her home to save money on dorm costs. Then there's Jack Anderson. Can't believe it. He sold dye to my business. We bought a lot from them. I'm going to get back at him times three. Sneaked back to my room. People say revenge should be cold. I don't think so. I like quick revenge. Get it done fast before they see it coming. I had to make a plan. That's what engineers do. We see a problem. We plan to fix it. First up, I had to stay away from Melanie as much as possible. Couldn't hide my anger around her now. Tomorrow's Saturday, Melanie's day to help at the animal shelter. I had to be up early. Not all good. But well enough she wouldn't stay home for me. KJ, now in her last year of high school, could help if I needed. Later, Melanie came in, turned on a light. I yelled out. It hurt. She turned it off quick, whispered she'd sleep in another room and hoped I'd feel better. I made a sound back. Next morning, Melanie checked on me, but I fell asleep again. She picked her clothes and left. After telling KJ to watch me, she went to work. I got up, showered, and dressed. Downstairs, KJ was making breakfast. Pancakes, eggs, bacon. Hey, Dad. Mom said you had a bad headache. Didn't think you'd be up yet. Want breakfast? 
Yes, please, you're amazing, KJ. She smiled, love in her eyes. She's my everything. Had to sort this mess with little trouble for her. It's her last high school year. Next year, college. We talked about school, boys, sports. Then I asked, chosen a college for next fall? Not sure, Dad. I want to do engineering, but don't want to upset you. Why would that upset me? I asked, proud my kid wanted to follow my path. I'm thinking of Cornell. Wow, our old school, that's awesome. No, Dad. Cornell University. I was a bit let down, it was the other Cornell. Still, it's a top-notch engineering school. Could get used to it. That's great. They're one of the best. Proud to have you graduate from either Cornell. Sent in your application yet? Four weeks ago. Hope to hear by Christmas so I can plan. I'll see if I have any contacts that can help. Thanks, Dad. After we ate, I said I had to work. Had things to do, but first my kid checked the bios of all engineers in our company. None here went to Cornell University, but two in other plants did, including one boss. I knew him. Would call him Monday. Now, to plan my revenge on my possibly soon-to-be ex-wife and Jack Anderson, he'd be easier. Spoke to some guys at work, yes, on Saturdays. Some were from tough backgrounds, a few with pasts. Asked them who could help with a prank. They said, talk to Andy. Perfect. Exactly what I needed. Andy wasn't in on Saturday, so that had to wait for Monday. Made a list for Monday. Speak to Ben in New Jersey for KJ, then to Andy, then HR. Check on cashing out for a lawyer. Heard horror divorce stories. Wasn't going to be me, but today had more to do. Went to the bank, left only $10,000, opened a new account and got a new credit card just for me. Paid off my old card and dropped its limit. Then called a private investigator. Needed to know Jack's schedule. Set up a Monday meet. Went to Radio Shack. Bought cameras and recorders. Called Melanie around noon, acting normal. Sorry about last night. All good now, I forced out. She was busy at work, said she'd be late. I had hours to get my stuff done. So back home I went. Wiring the house took me three hours. Lucky for me, I hung out with friends all day. Teens don't stick around home much. The system worked great. I set it up to record on a new laptop hidden in the basement. No one ever visits there, not even for laundry. Melanie insisted on moving it to the second floor, costing a lot. All to make her happy. Now, I needed to rake the leaves, hoping to be halfway done by the time she got home. Around five, she popped out to say she was home and ask how I was. Fine, just raking leaves. Should finish by seven, I said. She offered to help after changing. Soon, she joined me with her rake and we cleared the yard together. I kept quiet, not wanting her to guess anything was up. By 6.30, we were done and she started on dinner. After a quick shower, I threw on a Cornell College sweatshirt, curious about her reaction. Downstairs, she was setting the table. Dinner will be ready soon she noted. Perfect timing. I went out to drag the leaf bags to the curb for Monday's pickup. Fifteen bags down and still more leaves. Back inside, I washed up and sat down for dinner. A simple meal, yet every little thing seemed to trigger me. I smiled and ate quietly. She talked about her busy day at the shelter. I half listened, reacting minimally. After eating, we watched TV for a bit until I excused myself to bed early, hoping to shake off a lingering migraine. I was beat. Next morning, I was off to church. Melanie passed this time. It had been rare since July. At church, the sermon on forgiveness had me wrestling with my feelings toward Melanie. Post-service, a friend inquired about my Halloween. I shrugged it off. KJ had mentioned a migraine too, but I had other things on my mind. At home, Melanie had lunch waiting. Her cooking had improved vastly since we married. I remembered the early days of questionable sandwiches. Post-lunch, she realized she forgot to cook some hamburger, but it led to a light moment between us. I then mentioned I'd check my deer blind in the woods, surprising her since I hadn't hunted in years. In Michigan, the hunting season opener is a big deal. It gave me a day away planned. That evening went by without much happening, which was fine by me. Next day at work, I hit the ground running, messaged Ben in New Jersey first, arranged a meeting with HR, and caught up with Andy for a private chat. Andy agreed to meet in my office, where he joked about me being the boss. Despite the jest, it was clear he respected my know-how around the place. I was pretty out of the loop when it came to work stuff, and even more in the dark about things at home, clueless. Yeah, that was me. But then I hit up Andy. I needed to chat about something personal. And I needed it to stay just between us, nowhere else. For real. 
Only if it was something huge, like planning something wild, would I spill. I'd even cover for you. No sweat. It's nothing too crazy. At least most folks wouldn't think so. Go on, he said. I'm listening. I'm thinking about hiring a hooker for... He jumped in before I could finish. Whoa, thought you weren't into that. It's not for me, I told Andy. It's a sort of payback for a former pal. Why get him a hooker if he's not your pal anymore? He's messing with you. No, just call it revenge, end of story. You'll get picks to hold over him? Nope. Picks might happen, but not for blackmail. I need a specific kind of hooker. One who looks like the girl next door. You're looking to mess up his home life? That might happen. But what I really want is for him to catch chlamydia. Could that work by November 14th? That's rough, Andy said. But I'm impressed. Just don't make me mad. You think you can do it? Yeah, I think so. The hard part is finding a hooker okay with getting sick for a bit. I can throw in $1,000. Enough? Not sure. She'd have to stop working for a bit. Okay, how about $2,000? Toss in $1,500 for you to seal the deal? Deal. I'll get you the details later. Get your girl ready. Andy left, and I leaned back, grinning. Time for phase two. As the go-to engineer, folks always hit me up for my take on stuff. I flipped through my contacts, looking for the right one. Then I found it. XYZ Dye Company. We hardly bought from them, but that might change. I rang them, asking for a sit-down ASAP. They were thrilled. Could do it today. Happy with my plan, my CEO Brad popped in. Morning, he said. Morning, Brad. I was going to set up a chat with you later. Got time now? Sure, let's chat, he replied. Heard you were in this Saturday. Anything I need to know? Kind of what I want to talk about. It's personal, barely related to work. You've been with us nearly 20 years. We're family. Anything you need, just say. So I spilled the beans, asked him to keep it hush, and he agreed. Can't believe Melanie did you dirty. Makes me look at my own marriage. How can I help? My ex-buddy. He's the sales guy at ABC. I helped him get in here. But now I want to switch to another company, especially if they match or beat ABC's deal. That's your call, Brad said. Who you thinking of? X, Y, Z. We've bought from them. They're solid. What do I tell ABC? Say we're not happy with their rep and X, Y, Z promised us better deals and quicker service. That's if today's meeting goes well. I'll let you know, I said. Thanks, Brad. Feels good to have backup. Brad left. I was smiling. Plans shaping up. Next step, a divorce lawyer meeting on Tuesday. Then I checked my emails. An HR message said I could drop by. Went straight to it. At HR, Sherry asked what was up. Told her I needed to cash out my 401k. She warned me of the big tax hit unless I moved it to another retirement account. I knew, but my hands were tied. What do I need to do? She helped me fill out forms, still trying to change my mind. Before leaving, I asked about vacation days. Six weeks total, she said. Perfect for my plans. I should get the cash in my new account in 10 days. The XYZ meeting went well. Brad, Mr. Smith, and the tech guys were there asking solid questions. The XYZ rep handled it all, leaving us sure we were making the right move. After the talk, I asked Brad to wait until next Monday to speak to ABC. He agreed, giving X, Y, and Z time to prepare. Post-work, I met up with a private investigator. I needed him to tail Jack and learn everything about his day-to-day -day life. Come Tuesday, I had a chat with my lawyer, learning a divorce might drag on for months since we're in a no-fault state, meaning proof of cheating wasn't needed. Worse off, a divorce would hit my wallet hard. Imagine that. Begging during marriage and then getting financially dinged at divorce. I told the lawyer I'd ponder over it, whether I could forgive past mistakes for my financial well-being. If Melanie kept up her antics, though, I'd push for action by year-end. The lawyer also mentioned out of three possible judges for our case, two were very sympathetic and often leaned towards the woman in financial matters. If it went that way, I'd end up funding Melanie's lifestyle unwillingly. Could we move past this? I deeply cared for her. If she opened up by Thanksgiving, maybe I could forgive. I'd give her chances to come clean, yet also enough rope if she chose to stray. Meanwhile, I planned to avoid intimacy since Halloween. Come Friday, Andy dropped by asking for a chat. We nailed down the plan with a woman who'd play the part by next Friday, ensuring she'd be contagious yet symptom-free for a while. Thanksgiving weekend would be decisive. After checking with the P.I., Jack's habits were predictable. A drink at a hotel bar post-work, then home. 
The weekend passed with endless leaf raking, if only my neighbors weren't stealthily adding to my pile. Sunday brought church with KJ, my daughter sensing something off but only got busy at work as my explanation, sparing Melanie any worry going into the holidays. Lunch with Melanie and KJ went as usual, the latter excited about a shopping trip. Alone at home, I hesitated but checked my laptop eventually. Hearing Melanie's half of a conversation with Jack reignited my anger. Monday, I confirmed Friday's setup with Andy at the hotel bar, painting a believable backstory. Brad reaching out to ABC hinted at us withdrawing our business, sending them into panic given our significant share. Promises of a new sales rep and matched quotes followed, setting the stage for a crucial Wednesday meeting with them, aiming for a better deal. This tale of intrigue, deception, and a quest for justice unfolds amid the complexities of marriage, betrayal, and the pursuit of a fair outcome rooted in love and conflict. After our chat, it was clear the boss was mad about how we'd been treated by the last sales guy. We told him how the guy acted like he ran the place and thought we'd always stick by. We did decide to keep using them, but just as a second choice now and then. It was time to leave, so we did. I rang my private eye to tell him to hang out at the bar on the next few nights to see if Jack turned up, especially on Friday when I had another plan in mind. Plus, I wanted photos by Thursday. Jack must have gotten a talking to. He surely was told he lost our account. That's a big dent in his pay. When I got home, I told Melanie I was off to clean my rifle in the basement for the weekend hunt. Down there, I got a call from the P.I. Jack was at the bar, had three drinks. Sure signs he was worried. Back upstairs, I asked Melanie about dinner. She seemed far away. I had to ask again. She said we'd order pizza, fine by me. I said I'd get my hunting stuff ready. When the pizza came, it was just us eating. KJ was out. Melanie seemed off, but I left it alone. After we ate, she asked if work was okay. She heard from Mary that Jack was talking about big changes at our place. I told her not to worry, that if something big was up, I'd know. I mentioned Jack was probably stressed about his job since they rely a lot on our business. I reassured her I'd keep an eye out at work. But we had the next day off for deer season, so it was just us engineers and maintenance crew trying to improve things. She worried about what we'd do if I lost my job. I brushed it off, said maybe she could talk to Jack. I promised I'd chat with Brad at work. She hoped I was right. Mary was worried too. Next day at work, we were all hands on deck since production was halted. Busy till about 3 p.m., then I checked in with my P.I. He was all set for Friday. He'd rigged a room with cameras if Jack took the bait. A couple hundred bucks can go a long way. Thanks, Bob, I said, planning to meet him after my hunt the next day. I had to prepare just in case, so I called the bank about a home equity loan, no strings attached, just in case Melanie and I needed it. When I got home, Melanie was still out. I checked my laptop, nothing new hung up my hunting gear, grabbed a beer, and just thought about life. When Melanie walked in, I tried one last time to connect, suggested we spend some quality time upstairs. She wasn't up for it, said maybe after hunting. I joked about being back by five to avoid careless hunters. I joked about dinner, knowing how she'd react. KJ came home, we had dinner, and I brought up an old cooking mishap of Melanie's for a laugh, but she wasn't amused. It was just us again watching TV, the night winding down as usual. At 8.30 p.m., I spoke up, saying I'd hit the hay so I could wake early and head into the woods at dawn. I thought, why not ask one more time? Do you want to come with? It was still early. But knowing my luck, if I slept now, I'd be wide awake at 3 a.m., tossing and turning. Well, no harm in trying, right? So to bed I went. Come 4.30 a.m., my alarm buzzed, and by 5, I was out the door. I found myself at Denny's ordering a big breakfast. As I waited for my meal, my mind wandered back to the past 20 years with Melanie. Where did we go wrong? How did it come to this? Could I ever forgive her? Was my love for her strong enough to get past this? When my food arrived, I barely touched it. Hunger had left me. Instead, I just sat there, lost in memories of better days. Had those days now passed us by? An hour and a half later, with most of my food still on the plate, I stood up, left a dollar twenty bill on the table, and left. I drove aimlessly until I ended up by the Detroit River. Looking across at Windsor, I pondered over my nearly twenty-year stay here. I hadn't achieved much. 
Never had I visited Canada's capital. This needed to change. I promised myself to visit every state capital and to explore Europe. With my free time soon to increase, it seemed doable. Before long, I headed to work. Walking in, I saw the maintenance crew busy with their tasks. There was a real chance I wouldn't be around in a year's time. My marriage was on the brink, my job was unstable, and my son TJ would be off to college. Soon, there'd be nothing left here for me. I spent the morning in my office, lost in thought until it was time to leave. Even catching a glimpse of Jack's antics couldn't lift my spirits. As expected, Jack, ever the womanizer, had taken a recently unemployed housewife to our setup room. I couldn't help but wonder if karma would catch up with him immediately. In two weeks Thanksgiving weekend, I planned to be out of town on an emergency. Jack's method was always the same. Listen, empathize, then offer a comforting solution. Watching them, bitterness filled me. I had once been Melanie's protector, her knight. Now those memories brought only pain. Their act was convincing. She deserved an award for her performance. As they kissed, the urgency between them was palpable. Jack was praising her skills, completely unaware of the act. Their encounter escalated until she skillfully made her escape, leaving Jack frustrated. Bob and I watched the playback, sharing a laugh at Jack's expense. He got what he deserved, Bob noted. In this tale, heartache and revenge twisted together in the life of a man coming to terms with the end of his marriage and the change it would bring. It's a reminder of how complex relationships can be and the lengths some will go to find solace or retribution. No way more than you think, Bob. Way more, I told him. I took the DVD, said thanks to Bob, and told him to send the final bill. Don't need your help no more. Got what I need. Got back home around four. Melanie was busy cleaning, changing beds, and washing clothes. Wasn't busy at the shelter today. Didn't think you'd be back till five. Was gonna start dinner. Did you get Bambi? She joked. Nope, but saw a deer. Tried to get close. It got mad and ran off. Glad to hear that, she said. So was I. It was something to see, I laughed. Gonna clean my gun and store it for next year. You're not going back out? Still got two weeks, she wondered. Nah, not feeling it. Maybe next year. Went downstairs, put my gun away. Didn't use it, so no cleaning needed. Took a moment to check my laptop for anything new. Saw her getting ready for work, then coming back at noon. Maybe it was a slow day at the shelter or she had plans, knowing I'd be out for hours. She made a phone call, wondered who she was talking to. Hey, Mary, she said. It hit me how she didn't seem guilty, chatting with Mary like nothing was wrong. Made me wonder if Mary knew about it all. Heard her talk about a slow day, not focusing because of what Mary said about Jack and his job. In my head, I figured she was really thinking about Jack. Listened more. No, he's out, probably missing shots at deer. Not bothered by it. He misses a lot, she said. Hit me hard, calling me clueless. Maybe at home, but not at work. She continued the chat. Yeah, might hit the leaves again. Love nature, but it's a pain. Might just move to a condo next. Changed into my old college sweats, hoping to remind her of better times. Wondered if she'd feel guilty for what she's doing. Could I forgive her and keep this going? Wasn't sure. Kept thinking, why her with Jack? Been months since we were close. Went outside. Needed to think. If she talked before Thanksgiving, maybe I'd forgive her. But lots to fix, especially trust and our close moments. After bagging leaves, went in. Melanie asked if I wanted anything from the store. Just a loyal wife, I muttered, but just said no thanks out loud. Checked the laptop again when she left. Heard her talking to Jack. Hey, lover. Just thinking of you she said. Chat went on till she thought I was back. This chat confirmed it. Was my marriage done? Nearly 20 years and what do we have? Thought of our daughter, the best part of us. Next morning at work, asked about the new guy from ABC. The ladies liked him. Said the last one was a creep. Told them to always speak up if something's wrong. Called the bank. Surprised by how much my house was worth. Bought it when prices were low. Still had good equity despite the market. Talked to Brad again. Shared what the office ladies said about Mr. Anderson making them uncomfortable. Brad said it wouldn't happen again. I agreed. Glad to move past it. He told me Mr. Anderson was being let go today. When he said that, I told him we might need him again soon. I smiled at that thought. 
I didn't want to upset Mary, but even if she didn't know it, her husband was already hurting her. Hey Brad, can we talk about what's next for me at work? You're not leaving, are you? He looked shocked. I'm thinking about moving to the London, Ontario plant, or maybe the New Jersey one, but I'd rather go to Ontario. Once my divorce is done, I'd love to come back here if that's okay with you. I think we can make it work, but I want you back, he said. I chose London because I wasn't sure about having to pay alimony, and being in another country might make that harder. Also, Brad, I'd like to be let go on December 15th. I have four weeks of holiday and ten personal days I want to use then. If I go to court, it should look like I'm not working. I don't want to do anything wrong, so if I need to be fired and then rehired in London, that's fine. I'll lose my place in line, but it's worth it. It'll mean Melanie needs to find a job. After 18 years, I'm not sure if her degree is worth much. A lot has changed in HR. This would be payback. Number three, after the sickness and the divorce. Now, who's clueless? When I got back to my desk, I called Ben in New Jersey to ask about Cornell University. He said it was all set up and she'd get her letter in a couple of weeks. Great, one more thing to tick off my list. I called Cornell's office and got through to the dean of admissions. I told him I wanted to pay my daughter's tuition and other costs up front. He was pleased and said, sure, once she's in, we'll give you the total. I thanked him and shared my contact info. Another task done. I decided to wait to talk to Brad about my Thanksgiving plans. I might use that time to see the place and look for somewhere to live. I spoke to my lawyer next. I said if we go through with the divorce, I want her to be served on December 20th in the afternoon at our place. I asked if they could do it at that exact time. It was a Saturday and I said I'd pay extra. They said it was possible and just to let them know a week in advance. Then I called a flower shop. I needed to know if they could make a delivery on December 20th at a specific time. Can you promise that? I asked. Yes, we can. Just give us the address and three days' notice. But there's an extra charge for a special trip. That's fine, I said, adding I'd call early that week if needed. I was still unsure. Could things still change? Thanksgiving would be the deciding time. I asked them about getting 17 red roses and one black rose sent in a special box. They said a week's notice was enough, and they could use a paper box and make it look nice. Okay, thanks. I'll call next month with all the info. Another tick on my list. I'd send the DVD to Mary on December 20th. On Christmas, I'd email Jack a photo of himself that he wouldn't like, hoping he'd enjoy his gift. For Melanie, I wanted to make a photo album of all our good times. I might seem mean, but I wanted her to feel the loss. I thought about asking Jay to go see Cornell University. I knew she'd miss her grandparents, but they'd likely be busy with Melanie. I'd tell KJ we were leaving on the 20th, but not to tell her mom. I'd wait till after Thanksgiving to say anything. That weekend would show if our marriage could be fixed or if it was beyond saving. At lunch, I asked Brad if I could take the afternoon off. He agreed. See you tomorrow. I'd really miss working with him. I hoped I could return soon. When I got home, Melanie wasn't there. Maybe she was at work or with him. I checked the computer. No calls. So, she was likely at work. Now was a good time to sort through my stuff. All the things we keep thinking we'll need someday. I started with the filing cabinet. Sure, she wouldn't notice if I sorted out old papers. I cleared out a lot of junk from three drawers. I left the important papers for later. Those would go in next. I found the boxes of our old photos, the ones before everything was saved digitally. So I put all those papers in the filing cabinet, thinking it would be neat for when I began that project. I figured I'd have to sift through our computer for photos to print or maybe download them to get them printed on good paper. I wanted this to look sharp, no doubts there. Then I headed out to the garage to sort and box up my tools. Melanie wouldn't spot those either. I packed them in boxes and hid them in the basement. This way, when it was time to move my stuff, it'd be a simple haul upstairs, then out to the garage and into my car. Around 4.30 p.m., I decided to grill some steaks. It was chilly but I really like fresh grilled steak. I also grilled corn and asparagus. I tossed three potatoes in the oven to bake, and by 5.30, both Melanie and KJ were back. You made dinner? When did you get home? Melanie asked. Work was slow, so I left early, I told her. I knew this would make Melanie worry even more. We sat down for dinner, and Melanie said, I got a call from Mary. Jack lost his job today. Lost his job? I thought to myself, more like he was fired. 
That's awful, I said aloud. What's he going to do? Look for a new job, she replied. Good thing Mary is working, I added, just to nudge Melanie's worries a bit more. Are you sure your job is okay? You did say it was slow, she asked, nervous. As far as I know, we're fine, I reassured her. We spent the meal listening to KJ share about her life. I treasured these moments, knowing they'd be less once I was gone. I planned to keep in touch, regardless. The days passed quietly, and then it was a week before Thanksgiving. During dinner, KJ had a request. Mom, Dad, Kelly asked if I could join their family for a ski trip in Colorado over Thanksgiving, she shared timidly. When would you leave? Wednesday afternoon, she said. Well, your grandparents aren't coming till Christmas, so it's fine by me if your mom... The next day, I spoke with Brad, my confidant. Brad, I need your help for Thanksgiving weekend, I began. Need time off, he guessed. No, I need to set up a scenario to test Melanie, I explained. I wanted to create a fake emergency that would take me out of town, giving Melanie the chance to show her true colors. You think it won't work out between you two? He asked. If she's honest before Thanksgiving, maybe. If not, well, it's over, I said. Brad agreed to help with my plan. Driving home, part of me hoped for Melanie's honesty. I truly loved her and didn't want to lose what we had. I suggested we have dinner out on Tuesday, seeing as we'd miss Thanksgiving together. KJ was excited, feeling guilty about missing Thanksgiving. I managed to book us a table at Lakita, an upscale place for Tuesday. It felt like a last celebration, a final good meal together, mirroring what we had before any of this turmoil began. I let KJ and Melanie know we had plans at 7.30 the next night. KJ texted me right back, but it took until the afternoon to hear from Melanie. I wondered what she was up to. Now that Jack didn't have a job, I had a few guesses. On Monday, Melanie wanted to know if I could be a job reference for Jack. I said yes, thinking I'd get calls from places wanting to hire him. I was eager to tell them what a mess he was. That Tuesday, we went out to a fancy dinner. Melanie worried if we could pay for it. I told her we could afford it, wanting to treat us. We spent the evening talking about the good old times, how KJ was doing in sports and school. It was nice to remember the past together. KJ got ready for her trip to Colorado, staying with Kelly. I offered to pay Mr. Barron's for the extra cost, but he wouldn't take any money, insisting it was a gift. I gave KJ some spending money and made her promise to call me when she got back. She was curious about the news I said I'd have for her then. KJ hoped whatever was troubling me would get better, which showed how sharp she was. We got home and quickly went to bed. I stayed awake, thinking, while Melanie slept peacefully. The day before Thanksgiving was slow at work as it usually is. Most left early, but I stayed until four since I needed to support the team. When I got home, Melanie had a visitor, Mary, who was worried about her husband, Jack, feeling down and not even interested in being close. They thought finding Jack a job would help. Later, I overheard Jack planning to meet Melanie when I was gone, thinking I'd be at the office. It made me more suspicious. Thanksgiving Day, we kept our lunch simple but nice. Then a work call came, pretending I needed to go to New Jersey for an emergency at work. Melanie found it hard to believe, wondering why now. I explained it was urgent because of a big order we had. I had to make sure everything was perfect. I packed quickly, making sure my laptop would record anything happening at home while I was gone. Melanie helped me find my things, not knowing my real plan. I packed for all occasions, making sure I was ready for anything. Melanie watched me, puzzled by the amount of stuff I was taking. I pretended it was all necessary, hiding my true feelings and plans. I had to be at the factory by 6 a.m. Catching a flight at 2 a.m. wasn't for me. Well, I'll miss you, she said. I looked back at her. Her words sounded nice, but her face didn't match. If Melanie did what I thought she was doing, those words meant nothing. I tossed my bags into the car. I went back inside and asked Melanie if she could drive me. Or do I leave my car at the airport? Driving me meant she'd have to pick me up on Monday. She didn't like driving in Detroit. Traffic was a nightmare, especially near the airport. But driving me meant I wouldn't have my car to come back early if needed. I'll drive you. It's Thanksgiving. I want more time with you. She really was trying to make it sound sweet. I thought, okay, we should head out soon. What to do until then? I gave her a look. No time for that, she replied. Maybe when you're back. Or maybe not, I thought. We'll relax then, 
I said, grabbing a beer. I sat down. She did too, but chose a chair across from me. Sorry I have to go, but it's important, I said. I get it, she replied. I'll be alone all weekend. I told her to call Mary, catch a movie, get dinner. She needed a distraction. I asked if she was helping at the shelter again. They were trying to get pets adopted out by year's end. That's Saturday sorted. What about Black Friday shopping? She wasn't interested. Just curl up with a good book then, I suggested. She'll find something to do, I was sure. The drive to the airport was just small talk. Just drop me here, I said at the airport. She stopped, I got my stuff and didn't even get a hug goodbye. A quick kiss and she was off. We didn't say I love you. Inside the airport, I waited, hoping maybe she'd return. She didn't. I rented a car, too expensive but necessary. I found the rental car, loaded up, and headed to a hotel near home. I wanted to watch the house, see who came and went without being too obvious. The car I got blended in. By 9 p.m., I drove by. No one had come. The TV was on inside. Maybe Jack was staying home this Thanksgiving. I went back, called Melanie at 10 p.m., saying I got in and was going to bed early for the early start. Miss you, she said. Miss you too, I said back. But I missed the person she used to be. The next day I slept in, something I hadn't done in weeks. Put on casual clothes and drove by our house. Jack's car was there. Could it be Mary's, though? I needed to check her bank for her car. If it was there, then I knew. And it was. Tomorrow I planned to sneak in while Melanie was out. I spent the day seeing how Detroit was slowly improving despite its issues. I didn't call Melanie that evening. If she wanted to talk, she'd call. She didn't. Saturday, I slipped into our house while Melanie was out, found the videos on her laptop and took them with me to watch at work. My heart sank seeing the footage. Melanie and lingerie I bought never worn for me, her and Jack, together. She never liked being close with me, but with him it was different. Her words felt like a heavy blow. I thought hard about what went wrong between us in bed. When we first got together, things were wild, and our honeymoon was just us together non-stop. We pretty much lived on room service food. Even the first year was all about being close, sometimes more than once a day. Even when she was carrying KJ, we couldn't keep our hands off each other. But after KJ was born, things took a dive. I get that a new baby eats up time, and you're tired all the time. But even when our little one had a sleep routine, the spark didn't return. I kept wondering what I did wrong to make her not want me anymore. Then I saw it on the screen. They were already going at it. He was dominating, just pounding away. Doesn't he go hard like this? He said between grunts. Never, she answered. Then he switched it up put her on her hands and knees, and went at it again. This scene felt too familiar, almost rehearsed. He was hard on her, and she was loving it, making noises I hadn't heard in 17 years. Maybe I wasn't tough enough for her. I had every angle covered, her face from the headboard camera, a side shot from the closet, and an overhead view from the ceiling fan. I couldn't watch anymore. I paused, printed the evidence, and shut everything down. I guessed Mary wouldn't be too happy to see these photos. Come Monday, I'd have to speak with Brad about moving. Leaving this place would be hard. It had been a huge part of my life. Back at the hotel, thoughts flooded my mind. Melanie no longer wanting me, but okay with being treated poorly by another. It hurt. I bought some beer and tried to drink away the pain. The next day, I was a mess. I realized my marriage was a lie. The only good thing was KJ I hadn't eaten since yesterday so I went back to the same diner. I needed to stay low for another day. While eating, I plotted my revenge. I would serve her divorce papers in the most shocking way on Christmas when her parents were around. The picture collage from the zip drive would be the final blow. KJ called, asking about my plans. I picked her up and she immediately knew something was wrong. We're getting a divorce, I told her, explaining the betrayal. KJ was shocked but understood we couldn't pretend nothing was wrong. We agreed to act normal until I exposed everything right before her grandparents' arrival. Can't you fix it? She hoped. No, honey, I sighed. It's done. I spilled the truth because KJ knew something was up. She's smart and needed honesty. Despite everything, we'd get through this. She believes I have no clue. But I caught on last Halloween. That's when my migraine hit. Who's doing it? It's not someone I know, right? Well, it'll come out soon enough. Yes, Dad, it's Jack Anderson. Does Mrs. Anderson know? Not yet. I said. Wow, Jasmine will be crushed. She adores her dad, she said. Yeah, she really looks up to him. 
No, Dad. It's like she can't get enough of him. That's why she's going to Wayne State, to stay close to her dad. I had no idea. This will hit her hard. Make sure you're there for her. I said she might not want my help. Dad, it's my mom he's caught up with. Right. Maybe Mr. Anderson and your mom have something real, I suggested. I'm going to start the divorce right after our Christmas, I told her. That seems harsh, Dad. I know, KJ, but it has to be before the new year. I need to do it for myself. Silence fell. Now, for some good news, I said with a smile. Good news? I could use some after that shock. You're going to get a letter from Cornell soon. What? Really? Your dad has friends, but you earned this, I just heard early. I'm also covering your tuition, room and board, and books for four years. How can you afford that? She asked. That's where my friends come in. Don't worry, just focus on studying something you love. I'm going to be an engineer like you. Who's obsessed now? I joked. Dad, I love you. So keep this happy feeling for the next few weeks. Don't let your mom suspect anything, I said. What about visiting the campus on December 20th? You'll miss your grandparents for a bit. That's perfect, Dad. I'd rather not be around Mom when you tell her. I parked a bit away in a rental car so Melanie wouldn't see. KJ took her things and went inside. Melanie welcomed her. KJ acted perfect. Did all women deserve Oscars? Melanie had fooled me too. On Monday, I spoke with my lawyer. It's a go. Papers would be delivered on the 20th. Then I called the florist for a delivery on the same day. I wanted 17 roses with a black one in the center. The note would say, 17 good, one bad. Look under the lid. I wish I could see her face. Maybe I'd set up a camera. I also had to time it with her parents' flight back. That afternoon, I returned the rental. Melanie was picking me up. I wondered if she'd mentioned my silence. She could have called. I felt no guilt. On our way home, I suggested Chinese food. Melanie said KJ had news. What is it? I'll let her tell you, Melanie said. I can't wait, I replied. Home by 6.30, KJ ran to me with her news. I'm in! Cornell! She yelled. That's fantastic, KJ! I thought you meant our Cornell! I said, glancing at Melanie. Now Chinese felt too simple for such news, but KJ loves it. Strange. My mind went to Monty Python KJ's joy lifted the mood. I dreaded the evening with Melanie, but KJ kept us happy. I'm proud of KJ. Melanie deserves praise. At 8.30, I said goodnight. At 10, Melanie joined me in bed, but I turned away. Thankfully, things went back to normal after that. No more attempts from either of us. Just two more weeks. Tuesday at work, I asked Brad for some time off. I still had lots to sort out. He said, Okay, let me know how I can help. After that, he went home and pulled out all kinds of photos. Birthday, Christmas, anniversary ones, even baby pictures and hospital bills. These would make a perfect Christmas gift for Melanie, he thought. She'd remember the good times. And then, boom. He'd drop the flower collage picture on her, right before giving her the divorce papers. The first thing in the photo book would be that big buy from the jewelry store. It cost $4,000, which was a lot of cash back then. It's still a lot, but it feels different now. The next pages would have their honeymoon at Niagara Falls. Not too many snaps from there. They hardly left the room. Maybe when he and KJ head to Cornell, they'd swing by Canada and check out the falls again. But Melanie won't join them this time. After the falls, there'd be a snap of their first tiny place. They didn't stay there long because they needed more room when they found out KJ was on the way. Then came pics from their first big trip together to California. The drive was long but fun with his new wife. They stopped at the Grand Canyon, saw Vegas lights, passed through Death Valley, and finally got to her folks' place. Just in time, too, because her parents would be flying in on December 20th this year, right when he'd share the photo album. He remembered that trip well because that's likely when KJ was made. It was a great journey. He missed those days, being happy with a wild and true wife. Next, he planned to put in photos of her pregnant. For a small lady, she really showed. He adored pregnant Melanie. She was so sweet and needed him more. But the joy of having their baby overshadowed everything. Then he thought about including the hospital bill. Insurance covered most, but they paid some too. It didn't bother him whatever was needed to welcome their baby. But as he went through the bills, he stopped cold. There was a charge for a tubal ligation dated a month before KJ was born. Why? Who asked for this? 
He needed answers. He couldn't ask the doctor. She died 15 years ago in a crash. But maybe others in her practice could help. He grabbed the bill and drove to the OBGYN office. Melanie still went to the same place. He walked in cool-headed and asked to speak with someone about billing. An elderly lady about 60 came out. He explained he needed to check some old bills. Of course, she said. Let's look for your wife's file. But first, do you have permission to see these? He showed his ID, and it turned out he did have permission, thanks to forms they signed for emergencies. This was certainly an emergency. Can we look at the bills from when Kelly Jane was born? He asked. The lady found the bills, reliving the moment when they had to do a C-section after ten hours because KJ hadn't turned yet. As the billing lady reviewed, she gasped. He demanded, What? Show me! He knew the law required they give him copies if he asked. There it was, black on white, the C-section and tubal ligation, planned a month in advance on Melanie's request. I need copies, he said, doing his best to stay calm. I'll come back in two hours. And he did, after walking around aimlessly trying to calm the storm inside. The copies were ready in a manila envelope. Back at home, he couldn't face Melanie. The betrayal was too much. He decided to stay at a hotel, work, but avoid home. He saw Melanie in the kitchen. I've got work travel coming up, he lied, barely masking his rage. She retorted with something about his job problems. He packed feverishly, avoiding any further talk. KJ came in, sensing the tension. I'll be away for a bit, but call if you need anything, he told her, seeing the worry in her eyes. Bye, Dad. Hope you sort things out, my daughter said as we hugged. I remembered the photos and papers I had left in the basement. Need to grab my carry-on, I told her, and down I went. I stuffed all the photos and papers into my carry-on and hid the laptop. Back upstairs, I hugged KJ and told Melanie, Need to catch my flight by seven. I'll park my car and call you from the hotel. Then I left. I drove to Detroit, got a room at an extended stay America, a nice spot with a small kitchen. I could stay here for a week or so. I unpacked my clothes and just sat there, lost in thought. My life was turning upside down. Just a month back, I was all happy and had no clue. Sat there for who knows how long. Melanie had tricked me. She planned the C-section early to hide her tube tying. She faked her labor pains to be in the hospital on the set day for the C-section. They made me wait outside for hours. I couldn't watch. I couldn't believe it. Guess I was clueless. Should I go back and face Melanie now? But I knew I'd lose my cool. Maybe worse. I've never raised a hand to a woman, but in my rage, who knows? I needed to cool off. The plan had to stay for now. Not seeing her face for a week sounded good. I planned to call Brad in the morning. Wanted him to talk to the plant manager in London. I needed to get out of the country. I didn't want her to find me. My phone rang. It was KJ, nearly 10 o'clock. Wow, had been sitting there for about four hours. Hey, KJ, I answered. Why so mad earlier? You didn't even say bye to mom. It's bad, KJ. Where are you? Can she hear you? No, dad. Said I was at Kelly's. I'm parked at the park. Where are you? I'm at a hotel downtown close to work. So not leaving town? She asked. Nope. Just needed space from her. What happened? I found the hospital bills from when you were born. Found out your mom chose the C-section and got her tubes tied. I never got a say in having more kids. Dad, I'm so sorry. Maybe confront her now. Forget the Christmas plan. Can't, KJ. If I went home, I might do something terrible. Need to cool down. I wish I could help. Just act normal. Don't let her suspect anything. This needs to surprise her. But Dad, what about us? I'm not leaving you. Just need some time. We can always talk. It won't be the same, she said. We'll make it work. Love you, KJ. Love you too, Dad. Next morning, I talked to Brad about finding a new job slot, asked him to arrange a preview in London and to fire me on the 15th. He said they'd rehire me there with all my seniority if I commit to three years. I agreed. They were being kind. That night, packing for London, KJ called. How are things, Dad? Okay, how about you? I'm fine. Mom's worried you didn't call. I'll call her. Oh, and Mrs. Anderson called about Jasmine's issue ended the call with so much on my mind. Life was getting more complicated, but I had to keep going for KJ, if nothing else. Oh my. I heard KJ say once that Jasmine was way too into her dad. But what if it came from him? Does she have a guy who passed it to her? I wondered. 
Mom told me Mrs. Anderson said she doesn't. So who did? When I asked, she wouldn't spill the beans. She mentioned the guy might not even know he's got it. She needs to tell him. And if she's been with anyone else, they need to know too. I passed this on. She admitted she's only been with one guy. She thinks KJ should talk to her. She needs a buddy right now. Maybe you can help her talk to this guy, I said. Wow, I thought. KJ did mention Jasmine's odd thing for Jack. Maybe we're getting to why. This could really shake up their family. I felt bad, especially for Mary. She's a good one. She doesn't deserve this. See what you can dig up, KJ. Stick by her, I urged. I promised I would. Dad, I'm off to see another plant tomorrow. Might be out for a couple of days, but call me if you need to, okay? I said. Sure, son. Safe travels. And don't forget to call your mom, he replied. Will do, I replied. Love you, KJ, Dad said. Love you too, Dad. I hung up, pausing to think. I needed to calm down before calling Melanie. I decided to keep it brief just to say I was okay. I tried to hide my anger with her as I dialed. Hi, sweetheart. Sorry, I forgot to call last night. Got in late, I apologized. It's all right, love. You worried about work? She asked. Have to fix some issues. They're counting on me, I said firmly, promising to solve our own issues soon. I'm tired, Mel. We'll call tomorrow, I said, ending the call quickly. Next day, I drove a couple of hours to London, checked the plant, and met with the manager. A good chap. In the afternoon, I hit the road again, aimed for Canada's capital. It was a bucket list thing. Reaching late, I got a room and called Melanie. Hi, honey, just got in. Long day, I explained. Anything fixed? She asked about work. Got a plan with the manager, I reassured her. Told her I'd be away till Wednesday, making her think of her weekend plans without me. Guess it'd make her worry. I hung up after setting a call for Sunday, then reached out to KJ. Hi, Dad. Just got home from being out with Jasmine. Call you tomorrow, KJ said. Sure, love. Good night, I signed off, exhausted from driving. The next day, I explored the capital, ticking it off my list. Excited for more travels soon. In the evening, KJ updated me. Jasmine was scared, hadn't said much. KJ wondered if there could be another way she got it, not just from the guy. I shared my suspicion her dad might be involved, which means her mom could be too. KJ was upset, especially about mom. Two more weeks, then we hit the road. Grandparents will look after your mom, I consoled. Returning to Detroit, I settled in with beer and a call to KJ, planning a day out after church. Let's do lunch, then try fouling. It's a mix of football and bowling, KJ proposed. I agreed, curious about the day and what KJ had learned from Jasmine. I didn't want to wake up feeling bad when I saw KJ tomorrow. Thinking about Jasmine made me feel guilty. My plan for revenge was meant for Jack, Melanie, maybe Mary, but not Jasmine. Things got messy. Sunday, I hung out with KJ. She said Jasmine told her about having a bad health issue. I said Jack probably had it too. That made sense to her. How'd you know that, Dad? I know someone Jack was with who had it. It added up for her. Jasmine was in love with him but knew they'd never marry. Yet she loved him still. We decided to drop the sad talk and just have fun. Sounds good, Dad. We did have a good time. Learned a new game, too. Had dinner and then split. She to her place, me to my hotel. I called Melanie and hit the bed. Next few days were all about closing out work stuff. Gave my projects away. My co-workers were puzzled, but I'd explain soon. Home on Wednesday night, I was ready to face Melanie's lies for a short while longer. She seemed happy to see me. Asked about the work trips. I kept it vague. Let her wonder. Bed was early that night. She didn't ask why. Guess we were back to usual. Thursday was more wrap-up at work. Co-workers sensed something off. Suggested drinks. Said tomorrow was better. That night I tackled the bills. Old style with checks. Not a fan of paying online. Then, the trap for Melanie. How about we send $1,000 to our charities? Her predictable reply came. Settled on $100. What she didn't know was I wrote them each a check for $100,000. Planned Parenthood, ASPCA, and Wounded Warrior Project. That'd shock her later. Just like Jack's news did. Told Melanie I'd be late tomorrow. Drinks with the guys. She planned something with Mary. Asked about her parents' visit. They were flying in next Saturday. Decided to do our Christmas before that. I agreed. I'd finish shopping by then. Friday, last drinks with colleagues. Saturday, I decked out our house in Christmas style. 
thinking of the holiday with KJ, my best gift. Wished Melanie hadn't ruined more possibilities of happiness like KJ decorated with tears. Not a pro decorator, but I did my share. By 4 p.m. I was done. Goodbye to this annual chore. Melanie would be home soon. Took the chance to mow the lawn last time for everything, including seeing the last of the leaves go. Cold hit. So I put on a Cornell sweatshirt, a nod to our past, now bitter. Cleaning up, I used the sweatshirt on the mower, didn't mind staining it. Planned on burning it anyway. By the fire, throwing in the sweatshirt along with tree limbs, Melanie showed. Suggested takeout, feeling unwell. Thought it was a UTI. Agreed to order whatever she wanted. Then she saw the sweatshirt in flames. Is that your Cornell sweatshirt? Why are you setting it on fire? Yeah, it got covered in oil, so I thought I'd just burn it with the yard trash. That's a shame. I know you really like that sweatshirt. We need to get you a new one. So, should I order pizza or something? Pizza? Cool. I'll call it in. Go clean up and fetch it. I grabbed my phone and rang up the local pizza place. Walking back inside, I couldn't help but smile. She thinks she's got a UTI. Wait till she sees the doc. I got changed, then headed out to get the pizza. Whistling to myself, I wondered what she'd do when she found out. Her doc told her it was chlamydia, and she'd connect the dots about Jasmine. She's not the best at math, but this, she could figure out. The pizza tasted amazing that night. Probably the thrill of revenge adding flavor. I love my pizza hot, unlike some. Come Monday, I'm all smiles at work. You look too happy, Brad comments. Sometimes things just fall into place. Maybe not how you'd think, but they do. What's up? He probes. Just wait for the drama at the Andersons. Remind me to stay on your good side. It's my last day, Brad. You won't have to worry about getting on my bad side, I joke. I can't believe you're making me fire you right before Christmas. It's all part of a bigger plan. You need to save the company. They wouldn't let you go or the CFO, so I'm out. Tell the others they gotta work even harder now. You really think things through, huh? What do you want as a goodbye? Three months of pay plus any vacation and personal time. I'll sort it with HR. Keep it on the low. Thanks, Brad. You're a true pal. So when are you headed to London? Is March 1st too far out? That should do. Gonna miss you. Hope you get back soon. All depends on the divorce, Brad. But hey, I'm just a call away for emergency advice. I cleared my desk, walking out with my things. Said a quick bye to some folks. Got home early, but Mel was quiet, lost in thought. She must have learned it wasn't a UTI. Perfect time to drop the job news. We need to talk. That never leads to good news. She looks up. What's up? I got laid off today. Let that sink in. No, what are we going to do? She cried. I'll look for work. But things will be slow till next year. It's like a short break. I smiled. Why are you okay with this? How will we make it? Maybe you should look for work too. We have some savings. We'll manage for a bit. So what about dinner? Can we get something delivered? I'm not feeling great. What did the doc say? Another UTI? No, she's running tests. We'll know in a few days. So, pizza again? Let's get Chinese tonight, she says. Okay, six o'clock. We'll tell her about the job. I'm going to rest till then. Downstairs, I keep packing. Saturday soon. At dinner, we tell KJ about the job. She acts surprised. Gives me a look when Mel goes for soy sauce. Tuesdays spent online. Mel thinks I'm job hunting. Really, I'm planning a trip to different state capitals. Also did some house chores, avoiding Mel. Wednesday, she gets called to the docks. I call her, saying I'm running errands. Won't be home till dinner. When I'm back, she's in bed, said she got some bug and meds from the doctor. Downstairs, I eavesdrop on her phone rant to Jack. She lashes out about the STD, blaming him. Says it wasn't Kurt or anyone else since August. Then she warns Jack about the mess he's in, especially with Mary and maybe Jasmine. And there, amidst drama and secrets, life rolls on with its mix of hot pizzas, whispered phone calls, and cold truths waiting to unfold. Why would anyone want to marry someone who cheats? Jack, you're my only one. I've learned my lesson now. Never again. Kurt better not find out or he'll get real mad. At you. At me. This is goodbye. She figured it out too late. It's all done now. Only tears left. She'll be the one crying this time. Just three days to go. They say to enjoy the little wins. I kept telling myself that. But this was a big win. I hoped it would teach her a lesson to remember. 
I made a new email on Yahoo. I planned to scare Mary a bit. I wouldn't send her the video, but I would send an email saying, Jack has it too. Let her work it out. Then I went upstairs to sort through our stuff. I decided to keep only a few things. She could have the rest. I'd take things from our trips to the Grand Canyon and Vegas. Beyond that, I only wanted to hold on to KJ, the good part of my life. The rest felt false. I cooked some steaks for me and KJ to eat together. Melanie didn't join us. I told KJ that her mom got bad news from the doctor. She knew what I meant. Next, I went apartment hunting. Found one that was okay. They'd let me rent month to month if I paid dollar one hundred more each month. I agreed. I started to move my stuff from the basement. Clothes would have to wait until Saturday. When I got home, I saw Mary crying on the couch, talking to Melanie. I asked silently, What's wrong? Melanie mimed back, Acting innocent, Jack. I smiled to myself and left the room. Later, I took KJ out for dinner so they could talk more. Melanie looked guilty. Over dinner, KJ and I talked about tough things like cheating and sickness. KJ asked if I was sick too. I explained that her mom and I hadn't been close for months, so no, I wasn't. KJ was shocked. It was hard to discuss with my daughter. I shared how things changed between her mom and me after KJ was born, but I found out the hard reasons for the change later on. KJ felt sorry for me and I for the whole situation. I told her about renting an apartment and my plans for the near future. I told her not to worry about me or her mom too much. We both loved her. By the end of dinner, we were both emotional but trying to stay happy. We needed to look fine for when we got home. Mary had left by the time we returned. Melanie told me about her talk with Mary and Jack refusing to leave. If things got too rough, Mary could come stay with us. I considered sharing my lawyer's details with her but decided against it. Didn't want to mess up my plans. Then I went to bed thinking about moving to London, Ontario. That way I'd be far but not too far from KJ when she goes to college. I charged my phone and tried to sleep, planning my next steps. The next morning I did some chores, knowing I wouldn't miss this house much. Too many mixed memories. I told Melanie I had errands and checked with my lawyer about the timing for the next step in our plan. I wanted everything precise. Then I stopped by a florist, holding a picture of Melanie and Jack, and asked to see a certain delivery. When shown, it was exactly what I wanted. I got 17 red roses and put them in a ring. In the middle, I placed one black rose. Then I stuck this setup on the lid using double-sided tape. I hid it under light tissue paper, making sure a bit was peeking out for her to find. The card was clear. 17 good, one bad, peek under. I made sure they'd drop it off right at 3.55 the next day. I paid extra for this to happen. Telling the lady I couldn't tip the driver, I gave her $1.20 for him. Home felt good that night, and I slept deep. Woke up at 8 and started a big breakfast. KJ had coffee going. Eggs, waffle mix, bacon, ham, sausage, biscuits, and gravy were on the menu. My dad used to say, Eat up. You don't know when you'll eat again. Melanie seemed to feel that one deep. After breakfast, we chilled. I planned to grill steaks at 2. With family time being key, especially around Christmas this year, we shared old Christmas stories, and it was a mix of sweet and sad feels. At 1.15, I got potatoes and a sweet casserole baking. By 2.45, steaks were sizzling on the grill. KJ joined to toss salads together while I minded the grill. Lunch was great, and we just enjoyed being together. Around 3, we started on gifts. The big ones last. My gifts were the basics, but KJ got extras from her mom and me. Then, KJ got a slightly used laptop from me, ready for college. Melanie gave me a box next with a new briefcase inside. My old one was ancient. I thanked her, knowing I'd use it well. Then it was Melanie's turn. She found a photo album from me, starting with a pic of the algebra book that kicked off our story. It had our whole life, dates, milestones, vacations, KJ's achievements, ending with an empty page saying, more to come in five minutes. As KJ and I tidied up, it hit 354. Right then, the doorbell. I nudged Melanie to get it, then left. The florist handed her the flower box. She found the roses, the black one, and then the card. The message stunned her. Just as she took it in, a woman walked up with papers and a card. It hit Melanie hard. Divorce was all the card hinted at. She passed out. The woman dialed 911, and we left. 
From what I heard later, Melanie was okay physically after the medics came. Her parents showed up worried, found her shaken with divorce papers next to her, and a tale unfolded from the photos and flowers. It was a huge shock, a story pieced together from many sides, ending a chapter suddenly. Why did you do it? Her mom was lost for words, amazed by what her daughter did. Her dad picked up the box with flowers, saw the black rose, and then the card. He searched and found the lid under the coffee table. His wife saw his shock. She looked at the lid. Her eyes grew big. She turned to Melanie and said, You didn't. Melanie started to cry. They moved everything to the kitchen table. They spread it all out. The lid was flipped so no one saw the picture. Her dad pulled out papers from an envelope as her mom said, You both can make it through this, but you have to work hard, Melanie. Then her dad said, I don't think they can, dear. He gave her a look. He showed a paper that seemed like an old hospital bill. Then he stared at his daughter. You had surgery to not have kids after the baby was born? Melanie's eyes popped. She yelled and fainted again. Her mom cooled her down with a wet cloth. When she woke up, she seemed lost. Her dad said, Melanie, you're my daughter and I love you, but I'm not happy with you right now. I can't believe you did this to your marriage, cheating or the surgery. He might have forgiven cheating. Women do weird things close to 40. He glanced at his wife. She looked away. But he won't forgive you for the surgery. He wanted more kids. Remember, Marge? They tried for years. You took that chance from him. They looked over divorce papers. Her dad asked, Is this right? Your worth seems to be about $65,000. Melanie said, No, Dad. We have investments, cash, and the house. It should be over $600,000. Well, this paper doesn't say that. He must be hiding money. We need a lawyer to find it. And so they did. I was in court in late January. I had to leave my trip early. I stood in front of the judge with my lawyer. The lawyer told me the judge usually favors women in these cases. She asked, Looking at your accounts from November, you had over $600,000 in everything. In your divorce papers, you claim it's about $65,000. Why the difference? Your Honor, $250,000 of that was for my daughter's college at Cornell this fall. So we're down to $350,000, then $300,000 went to charities we like. That's $100,000 each, leaving about $65,000. My lawyer handed her the proof. I added, The $65,000 is a guess based on our house and other stuff we own. She keeps her car, and me mine. You sent $300,000 to charity? Asked the judge. And did she know? Yes, on December 11th. I asked how much to donate. She said not $1,000. I guessed $50,000 or $75,000. She said, let's do $100. So I did. $100,000 each to Planned Parenthood, ASPCA, and Wounded Warrior Project. I meant $100, not $100,000, my wife yelled. The judge listened. Planned Parenthood and the ASPCA were her favorites. She couldn't ask for the money back. The judge had to move on. Before anyone else spoke, I said... Your Honor, I never had an STD. Maybe ask my wife the same. Turns out she talked to Jack since my Merry Christmas email with a picture of her with someone else. The judge noted, Cheating isn't why we're here. We're looking at where the money went. You paid for your child's college early. We can't make charities return the money, so I'll split the $65,000 and add $40,000 a year for her for three years until she finds a job. My lawyer stood. Your Honor... My client lost his job before Christmas. He's jobless. So we asked to pause support until he finds work. Okay, said the judge. Support starts when he works, ends in three years. I smiled inside. She didn't say anything about working in another country. My lawyer asked, Your Honor? Yes. She asked if we could end our marriage now. Do both agree to this divorce? My lawyer said I did. I looked at Melanie, her eyes mixed with hate and sadness. Her lawyer said she did too. She knew we couldn't fix things. The choice I made about not having more kids was too much, so it had to be. And we had to split what we earned. My lawyer said it was the quickest divorce he'd seen. So after a month walking through Europe, I started my new job in London, Ontario. I told them I'd stay for three years, maybe wanting to go back to Detroit after. I also promised to work super hard to make it the best place in the company. I left my marriage with not much money and so did she. 
but I could live with less, and in 15 years with smart choices, I hope to save up to $1 million. Fifteen years later, things didn't go as planned. I did go back to Detroit after three years. I left the London place in great shape. I came back as the boss of the plant. Brad had retired and said good things about me. Melanie went back to California. She's with her parents, helping them as they get older. She went out with some guys, but nothing serious happened. I wonder if it was because of her or them. Maybe when she shared why her marriage ended, they got scared. I'd like to think that. Married with two kids, one's an engineer working in New Jersey. They did great on their internship there, liked by everyone. They got a job offer after graduating. Mary made sure Jack paid a lot in their divorce. I guess he had enough to move to Lansing and work selling cars. Jasmine had a tough few years, saw a therapist, and then met a good guy. They're married with two kids. Now you might wonder where things went off track for me. Well, I moved back to Detroit. I wanted to help veterans, so I visited the VA facility often, trying to make their lives better. There I met Jackson, a vet who got sick probably from stuff he was around in Afghanistan. I got close to him in the eight months he fought his illness. He didn't make it. Before he died, Jackson asked me a big favor. He wanted me to take care of his family. He knew his wife and I might get along and gave me his blessing to be with them if it felt right. His wife was younger than me and they had three boys. It would definitely be a new start. I promised to look after them, no matter what. And if his wife Cheryl and I liked each other after dating, I'd be honored. Cheryl's last name? Vandermeer. She had Dutch roots from across Michigan. There's even a Dutch town there, Holland, near the water and dunes. It reminded her of home. Instead of saving to be a millionaire... I ended up with a family in Bloomfield Hills. I love this new life. Another thing, I saw Melanie at a college graduation. She looked empty, even after so many years. She came over, gave me an envelope, and said sorry. I waited to open it until on the plane back to Detroit. Inside was Melanie's letter. She apologized for our messy divorce and explained her feelings and mistakes. She reflected on her choices and acknowledged her part in our problems. It was a big step for her. She wished me well and expressed regret. Reading it, I felt a mix of emotions. Tears, a bit of a smile, and more tears. Dear readers, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe Queen Cheating Tales channel.